let's get going. So today we're going to quickly cover uh, defining content first design, and then we're going to show you what content first design is through a few example projects we have on our learn site. And then we're going to talk about starting a project content first. Um, this content for this webinar is based off of some articles from, uh, again, our learn site, the Balsamic Wireframing Academy. So you can check those out. We will link to all of the content uh, uh, on the webinar page once we release it. And uh, so here's some more. We, we do these things called process behind interviews. So I recommend you checking them out. You'll get some previews today. So what does content first design mean? Uh, it's actually really simple. It's uh, the, the content determines the layout or the design. So I'll have Amelia Barnes, uh, one of the uh, people I interviewed, uh, explain it because she does it much better than I do. You know, you can explain it really simply. Content first design is you decide the content before you decide the design, right? And I think the simplest way to make a case for it is you just have to know what you want to say first before you decide how to say it. So you can't say, oh, I know my book should have an orange cover until you know what your book is about. Um, and it's the same for a website, right? You can't say, oh, we're going to put a big picture, uh, a big hero image, because that's what's trendy right now. Well, I mean, maybe that works, but maybe it doesn't work too. You, you have to know what it is that you want to convey to people first, and then everything else falls around it. And that's, that's the basic idea of content first design. I love that. What I love the most um, is that she talks about what's trendy right now. And I think that's really important to understand that your content, uh, you need to think past trends when you're, you're designing something and you need to think about what you're trying to say and who you're trying to say it to first. And then you can um, layer on your branding and your visual design. So I thought that was great. Uh, one thing I wanted to call out is I feel like content design is having this uh, moment right now. And there's a lot of people working on content. You know, there's content designers. It's a much more um, popular job. But this idea that content first has been around for a very long time. Um, Jeffrey Zeldman's tweet is from 2008. And I think it's just a a reminder that this has uh, been a thought for a long time and that writing and how you say what you want to say is more important than how you uh, visually show it. Or you should consider it first because it's it's really important. So what I want to do is um, design in the absence of content is not design, it's decoration. I want to throw a uh, visual example of that. So I took a screen grab of YouTube. You can tell I have younger kids because there's lots of you know YouTube <laughs> Uh, YouTuber videos on it, but I think this is a great example of showing content um, first. And if you remove all the text, you can still see it, but it's a lot different. So a lot of the screen is made up of content, right? And YouTube is actually a really interesting example because it's pretty well designed and you can still guide yourself around YouTube without words because their their text, I'm sorry, their icons and their images um, do a really good job, but icons and images are content as well. So if you remove, remove all of that, it's really just a blank canvas. And I think what I like in my mind, what I think about is <clears throat> when we start a project because it's digital and it needs an engineer to build it, it needs someone with a lot of technical skills to make it a real product. We sort of forget you know, that it has to be simple and we need to start first with what we're trying to say before we think about any of that other stuff. So we really visualize building things is this really complicated process. And I intentionally left the iStock watermark on it because I thought it was funny. Um, just adds to the complexity. But we really want to show this simplicity of it. We want it to make it feel like a, you know, an infant's toy or a toddler toy. Um, and that's through content. So what do we mean by the content term determines the design is we start and we really just focus on what images and words do we need to convey our message. And then after we decide on that, we can work on tons of different types of layouts that fit that content. So if you start a project content first and you feel like you have a lot to say about your product, that's fine and write it all out, gather all the images, really work on that content and then start designing it. And you know, like here for content one and design one, Maybe it's got a really full website then, and you have a lot of content, there's a lot of stuff there. Maybe you don't want that. What, 
is great about starting content first is you can go back and edit down all of that content you already built. You have content two here and then design number two. And it's a, a much more simple minimalist website that is probably going to be easier to use. But if you didn't start content first, you may be trying to cram content one into design two, and it's just not going to work. And it's going to be uh, time consuming and kind of difficult. All right. So that's my little spiel about what content design is. Uh, let's show some examples. So we're going to kick it off by showing what I call system-based design versus people-based design. And this is the project that Emily Barnes um, presented in her process interview, where she worked for the United States government redesigning the finance uh, campaign finance website for the Federal Election Commission. And what they started off with was a design that was focused on systems. And what they ended up with through content first design was something focused on how people think about it. So here's Emily. So back when I worked for the government, I worked on the digital transformation for the Federal Election Commission, which is the group that tracks how all money is raised and spent in federal elections. So if you wanted to look up you know, who donated to Hillary Clinton or how much money she raised, like that is the organization that knows the answer to that. Wow. And they have been doing open data since they were founded in the 70s, which means that their website was a really early government website, which also means that it is pretty outdated when we got to it. And the way their content was organized was based on form. So if you wanted to know how much money Hillary raised, you needed to know which form that got reported onto the FEC. And they all had like numbers and nobody understood um, how to find that information. So even though the website content was organized in a way that completely made sense to the organization, it was, okay, all of the like Form C information is on the Form C section. There was no way to find out the information in a way that humans understood it, which was, what is Hillary Clinton doing? Um, so when we approached that website, you know, we, we've turned all the data into an API. That was the most important thing, right? So we could access it in different ways at different times. But we organized the content around the way people understood the content, right? So you could find things based on the candidate you were looking for or the person who donated that you wanted to find out what information they were doing. And by starting with the content rather than the organization um, or rather than our assumptions about what the content should be, it made the website something that people could actually use. I really love that. It's a, I think it's such a great example. And I think a lot of people, um, maybe here, but I know a lot of people work in big, large enterprise organizations where the design is determined by how the organization thinks about its own data and its own content. Um, and if you come at it from a content first plus a user perspective, a people perspective, you're going to have a much better experience. So I wanted to show a few screenshots from the original design they started with. And if I wanted to look up this video, uh, the interview is before the last presidential election. And so it was older candidates. But, you know, if you want to look up what a specific candidate is doing now, you or using the site, you'd have to go to data catalog here. And then you'd have to go into candidate disbursements and then enter their name. And then you get a listing. Um, you'd have to know all that stuff. You'd have to really play around with this site. And then through the content first and sort of people first lens, they redesigned it to be like this. And this is what's currently um, what their site is like now. So that using a content first design, using a people first design, they understood people want to either look up candidates and how much they're making or contributions from specific people. And they broke it up and made it much easier to use. And then they also redesigned um, what a candidate's page looks like so that you can easily search their data. They made it a way that we would expect it to work. So, and if you're working in a large organization, remember that your mental model of your data is probably not gonna match what your user's mental model is. So if you wanna start content first or work content first, you have to understand the organization system and also understand your customer's perspective and then redesign it so the content and design is focused on how the user is expected to work to uh, present it. All right, let's talk about redesigning an application. This is a more recent interview that I did with a content designer from Mozilla who worked on the totally new redesigned UI refresh of the Firefox browser. Um, and it's an awesome project and I'll have um, 
Betsy kick it off. So the project is based on read the project example is based on the application menu that she redesigned with her team. And I'll have her talk about how she started the project. So our first kind of step is to gather data to make some decisions. We know what our menu is. And I kind of referenced this early in the interview of how we want to kind of go on that detective finding mission and start gathering some data, see if previous user research has been conducted, talk to people at the organization who are really familiar with this, this feature or aspects of this feature that we can use to inform our decisions. So I love that. Um, as you can tell from pretty much any design project, it always starts with research and content design is no different. Um, she supplied us with this great image and it kind of showed off what they learned from their, um, you know, research uh, background context building. Um, earlier in her interview, she talks about leveraging institutional knowledge and trying to understand why it is the way it is now so that you can have a better understanding of what why what was decided on and what you can do to move forward. Um, this next clip talks about their content first approach and how they move forward after they gain, gain all that knowledge. As far as the content design process, what is the first thing that we do? Um, if you have worked with a content designer before, you will not be surprised to learn that we love a good table. We love a good spreadsheet. <laughs> Billy's <so> laughing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might put a question on you, Billy. Why do you think that is? I think it's just easy to organize information. Yeah, we do love a good table. And although the tables are, the use, the use of them is like you said, to organize information. I alluded to earlier how we had this menu that had a lot of different items in different places. Like where, where should we put things? Where goes what? Where, where do things go? Um, and we actually got this really good guidance from, I'm going to do another shout out here to um, our senior design manager, Michelle Hoybush, who has been in the content strategy field much longer than I have. And when you are looking at a daunting task in front of you, how am I going to organize all this content? Where do things go? I know, I know that it isn't right, but I don't know how to fix it. Instead of trying to fix it, she advised that we take a step back and just start grouping like items together. It's simple, like anyone can do that, that, right? And it kind of helps you take some baby steps into how you're going to solve it eventually. So the table, yes, it, it could be overwhelming. And depending on the size of the project, sometimes they do get really big and these spreadsheets have multiple tabs and oh my gosh. Um, but if you can start organizing the information, you can start thinking through it and you can start uh, getting ready to actually right we organize these what we call semantic groupings it's a little bit of jargon insider content lingo <laughs> but essentially it just means putting things that are similar together and just by grouping those in this table it started to help us see not even necessarily what we were going to keep or what we were going to move or what we were going to cut but what went with what and so that helped us move forward and how we were going to make decisions about how we were going to organize this menu That's I love that. So I think that's such a great um, takeaway is that if you feel like doing this um, or if you're starting your, your project content first, you're doing a content audit, the first thing you can do is take everything and try to group it to what makes sense logically. You know, as UX designers, we do this a lot in card sorting. It's the same type of thing. Um, you can do this with your users, with whoever, you know, is the end user or people that work in your, in your um, company. And it could be something you do together, but trying to understand what goes with what is a big uh, will be a big help when you're trying to do a new design because um, you're already organizing organizing it in a way that makes more sense. So after semantic groupings, this is what they worked on. The design team at Firefox have started to incorporate wireframing in our process for several reasons. Um, and when I talk about wireframes. I deliberately chose this screen to show you how low fidelity it is and how just kind of basic it is. So we actually started doing wireframes in Google Slides. We call them wire slides. And this is literally just drawing boxes. It is drawing rectangles, lines. So it wasn't too difficult, nothing too fancy. What wireframing helps us do is it helps us kind of move beyond that scary table stage and start organizing the information in the appropriate hierarchy. And it's really low barrier to entry. It's really easy to just start editing, to start putting words in and to start thinking through how you're gonna put, you know, 
where in this menu are we going to put certain items? What we have found is that this really low fidelity wireframe process is also an excellent way to start getting alignment and to start bringing in other people into your process. So there's questions that come up a lot of when do you do stakeholder reviews? How do you um, make sure that people are aligned? And my response to that is as often and early as possible. And if you can use a wireframe to align your team, um, you're gonna, the next phases in visual design is, is just gonna go so much more smoothly because you already have the content set. I love it. I feel like she's uh, promoting the process of wireframings for us because that's exactly how we feel here at Balsamic. Um, also, what I love is that this simple idea of using Google Slides to make really simple wireframes that can be easily shared. Uh, I love it. Her whole, the way that she talked about it, their whole process of, um, you know, doing some background research, leveraging the institutional knowledge, um, taking and all the data and then trying to group like things and then turning those into visual artifacts to then share with people and, and to get feedback. I think it's a great process. I did try to make a content uh, or take data from a website and turn it into a Excel sheet type image. And this is what I came up with. It's not great, but you get the point. Um, all right, let's move on to our next project, redesigning a feature. I really love this because it's a, just another approach to considering content first. And I think this is something that will resonate with a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs and solopreneurs who work on these smaller projects. Um, so let's, uh, I'll do a little background. This is about a product called Lead Honestly and an interview with the designer and uh, the creator of it, Shay Howe, and how he is redesigning a specific feature and he will let us, he'll talk about it. There's a process of adding an employee uh, to the product. Um, and we've gotten a lot of questions and feedback just of, you know, why is certain information asked? Uh, why is this information not asked? What's the experience for an employee? I can't see that. How do I know what that means? Um, and kind of just like getting an understanding of like what all that is. Um, and so for, for a while, I just started engaging people and asking them, well, what would you expect? What would you like? What's the optionality you'd be interested in? Um, trying to get a sense of like what that is. And, uh, have since started just redesigning that process of how to add an employee. That and uh, yeah, it honestly, like it started uh, in the simplest, like, like I always try and like go like low fidelity to high fidelity in this process. And I'd say in this scenario, I started at like no fidelity. <laughs> um, like, honestly, like, mean? I love yeah, that. Uh, I just like, it was literally all copy. Like I, I just created a Google doc um, and was like, let me write the copy for the interface. Let me, and like, let me stage it out. Like, cause there's basically, there's three steps in a completion state, right? So it's like step one, like we need to know the employee's name and email address. Great. We got that. Cool. Uh, and like in that, there's also the option, like, do you want to send them a welcome email to have, like to lead honestly or not? Right. Uh, cause some people don't want to, and they want to be able to invite their team members themselves and kind of engage a different way. So I just like wrote out what that would look like. Yeah. Um, step two is, um, a little more comprehensive because it starts to say like, all right, when, like, when do you want to meet? How often do you want to meet? Uh, do you want to install like a Google calendar integration to put this on your calendar? And if so, uh, what time do you want to meet? Uh, what's the duration of the meeting? Right. Things like that. And then the last part is uh, what playbook do you want? What type of questions do you want to ask this team member? Um, there's a lot. Cause then it's like, well, what's a playbook and what are the types of playbooks and what are sample questions from them? Things like that. And, uh, I literally just put it on a Google doc and went to those customers who had had like questions yeah. and said like, give me feedback. Like, what do you think? Uh, and like literally hadn't even put like pencil to paper on any of it uh, and just iterated on the copy to try and make it make more sense. I really like that. Um, so here's the example of the word doc that he created. And what I love is that he got, like he said, it sounded like a very complicated set of, you know, lots of different options, lots of things that can happen, lots of choices you have in the experience. And all he did was make a Google Doc and sort of mimic very crudely what an interface would look like and then sent it to these same people that were asking him questions and, and providing feedback to his product and said, like, is this better? Does this make more sense? And so he spent a lot of time just iterating in Google Docs and then went right to code 
and redesign the interface because he already had the product there. He just needed to update it because he needed to change it based off of what people um, were needing from him. And I thought it was such a really interesting process. Um, during his interview, I think he had another great quote that I liked is that he always starts with words, even if he's just sketching because you know, content first, the content really is gonna influence the design. And I think uh, this is a really cool way that you can approach content first, especially if you're tech savvy. So, you know, take customer feedback and then um, make copy iterations with customers. It works great if you have a mature product and you're getting that customer feedback and you have the ability to make the changes to the product. And I think it's an awesome way to do this no fidelity design or content first design. So here's another image of his product if you're interested. I like to kind of contextualize what he's building. So that was it for redesigns. Now let's talk about how you can start content first for a new project. Um, I think starting content first for a new project is similar to starting it just as any other project. You wanna start with some research, some background information, building that context. And then once you start thinking about it, you need to do stuff like site maps and user flows. You need to know exactly what pages you want on your site. You can debate this with your team and I'll come up with what pages do we need? And then from there, you know, what content are we gonna need? If it's more of an app, app based product or something that you need to do things on and not just sort of learn things, you can build, you know, user flows. This is an example that we have um, on our wireframes to go. But if I'm gonna, you know, pretend this is Instagram and I'm designing the change profile feature of my site, I need to know all of those places that are going to need microcopy. I want to make sure that the words I'm telling them um, throughout the experience of this process are going to help them along and be the best, you know, copy they can be. So I can start here. I can say I have seven different interactions. I'm going to need success language. I'm going to need error language. I'm going to need confirmation language. I want all of that to fit within our brand, within our voice and be clear to the user. The next thing you can do is something called a competitive analysis. So really try to understand the what's going on in you know, the field that you wanna play in, let's say. What are other businesses doing already? What messages are they, are they trying to communicate? Um, I actually made this uh, Google Sheets that, uh, Google Sheet template that you can download in the content first article. Um, and it's just a really simple way to capture what's going on. Uh, what values are they communicating? How are they writing? Like what ways are they expressing themselves? Um, what are their key differentiators? What are their features that they, they promote? And who's their audience? Who are they talking to? Can you really understand by how their, um, you know, their language, who, who's their audience? Does that match your audience? Um, this is another great way to do this. I apologize for not having the um, supporting image of where I, uh, text where I got it from. I'm gonna add that before I make this a PDF for you guys. But um, I thought this was great too. This is another great, easy way to do a competitive analysis. So say I'm in, I'm kayak here and I wanna see what the other groups of business and regular travel companies are doing, but I'm gonna talk about what features they have, but also add how I feel about them. And that'll help me build sort of my positioning about how I want to build, how I want to produce my work and how I want to write about it. And, you know, if I understand that I don't like the way um, certain people talk about it, it'll help me um, figure out ways I can talk about it better. So the next thing you can do, and I think this works really great with um, marketing based websites and like homepages and landing pages is something called content modeling. I did not add a screenshot here, but we have this as an article on our learn site. And I think it's fantastic. You should check it out. What I really like about content modeling is it really reminds me of the wireframing um, process with visual design. So content modeling is you start with really, really broad topics, and then you start filling in the fidelity of it as you understand it more. So another great thing about content modeling is you can kind of think of it as like a brainstorming workshop or like a design, a mini design sprint, and you can get together with your whole team and um, kick it off. So what you do is you start out by discussing the goals of the site or the project. You know, what are you trying, what do you want the audience to come away with? What are the must haves from the business perspective? And then what's the priorities in communicating all of this to them? What's the order of importance? So you can use a whiteboard, you can use post-it notes and just start writing out what do you want 
people to know what's the most important things. And then after you have all these major content blocks you think need to be on your site, organize them how you think they'll flow on the page. But the next thing you should do, and you shouldn't forget about this, is try to then understand what your customer's perspective is. What do they need to know? What's going to help them move forward? What's going to benefit them? What is their perspective? I like using these illustrations that we have on our learn site. So I just added it in there. And that represents this. So what you do is you take your idea of how the page should flow and then try to match up what you think the customer's perspective is. Um, side note, you can also totally talk to your customers and get their perspective about what they want or what they need. And then you, you know, just like try to match them up to what content blocks you have. If you're starting to see information that is, you think is more important to the customer, move those blocks higher up on the page. And then the next step is really simple. You can um, block out the content in wireframes in whatever fidelity you want. You know, each of these is a wireframe and, and you can start writing more and more content. If you're not comfortable um, writing, uh, if you're not comfortable in the wireframing phase and you work better in like, you know, the uh, Google doc phase, you can totally do that too. Take all those content blocks and start writing out every piece of content that you have on your page and then you can put them into the wireframe. And that's all I have. You know, I just realized I did not have a recap slide, so sorry, but um, that's it.